to the organization. And it's only the auditory system in the entire brain that you see this kind of organization. So the auditory system, uh, I like to imagine it as a, a cascade uh, in which there are several levels in the cascade. And each level in that cascade gives us an opportunity. And uh, if there is an interruption at uh, a particular level, then the uh, station above that is an opportunity for us to eat. So what do I mean? Supposing uh, you know you have the cochlea at the bottom, which is the peripheral end of. If the cochlea is damaged, we can intervene with the cochlea. And that is what we call as a cochlear implant. If the cochlea is not uh, available to us for some reason or the other. We can go into a higher station, and the next higher station would be the cochlear nerve. So, cochlear nerve again has got a lot of speed, and it is something which we can use. Or, a little higher level is the brainstem. The brainstem again, the cochlear nucleus, is a beautiful structure, which we'll talk about later. And it is a structure in which we can again intervene to restore the uh, continuity of the relation to give an auditory system. So this intervention at the brainstem level by uh, an electrode is what we call as an auditory brainstem implant. Uh, when the implant is kept in the brainstem and when it is stimulated, the electrical impulse is stimulated in cochlear nucleus. And uh, this gives the patient a sensation of the auditory there are, uh, as you can see from this uh, diagram in the uh, right side corner, there is a dorsal cochlear nucleus and the ventral cochlear nucleus. There are two parts of it. Here you can see it a little better. You have a dorsal cochlear nucleus, which is smaller, and a ventral cochlear nucleus, which is bigger. The ventral cochlear nucleus is then again divided into an anterior ventral cochlear nucleus and a posterior ventral cochlear nucleus. Anterior and posterior ventral cochlear nucleus. And uh, since we are approaching the cochlear nucleus from anterior to posterior direction, we always approach the posterior uh, and anterior ventral cochlear nucleus. And then, if the electrode is pushed deep enough, it will also touch the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So, what is the significance of this? Uh, uh, from here, that the higher frequencies, if you go above one kilohertz, one kilohertz to 10 here, 20, the higher frequencies which we hear are all codified in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So, if an electrode is not going deep enough, it's only stimulating the ventral cochlear nucleus, then we lose a lot of information in the higher frequencies. And as you know, the higher frequency information is extremely important for understanding speech because most of the consonants in speech are higher frequency. And uh, without that, understanding the consonant uh, information, we, we lose severely the ability to understand speech. So it's very important that this is understood that the dorsal cochlear nucleus is the uh, seat of the higher frequency. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the cochlear nucleus also has tonotopicity, just like we talked about uh, in the other stage of the cochlea, the further higher up also. What's different between the, the tonotopicity of the cochlea and the uh, brainstem nucleus is the cochlear uh, uh, tonotopicity is mainly two dimensional. In other words, it is like a piano organ, I can told you. So, you know, you, you stimulate the base of the cochlea, you get high frequency stimulation. You go to the apex of the cochlea, it codifies for the low frequency. So it's an upside down piano organ. But in the case of the brain stem, it's a little more complex. Here, the tonotopicity becomes three dimensional. So, what do I mean? It's not only on the surface of the cochlear nucleus that you have the tonotopicity. But it also goes into the depth of the cochlear nucleus. In other words, from the surface to the depth, again, there's a, a, a frequency range. So, if you're going to be stimulating the cochlear nucleus, 
uh, to get the maximum information out of it, you need to be not only stimulating the surface, but also into the depth of the cochlear nerve. So it has to be a three-dimensional dialogue. So this is a little more complex, and it, uh, you know, it adds on to the complexity of the, uh, the structure for our intervention. Now, what are the indications today of for auditory brain? Now, the classical indication, even today, is an NFT, the bilateral vestibular schwannoma, where we have operated on both sides. Now, today, the tendency is more and more uh, moving towards removing a vestibular schwannoma, not only preservation of the facial uh, that that is essential. But also preservation of the cochlear nerve uh, wherever possible. It's not always possible. It's very, very difficult actually because uh, those who visible from us will understand. It's a, an extremely difficult uh, thing to do because the tumor very often envelops the cochlear nerve and very closely adhered to it. And at that level, in the CP angle, the nerve is extremely frayed. And uh, you can easily uh, damage it and cause discontinuity. Uh, and in a very complicated surgery of that sort, you know, the, the surgeon's priority, of course, uh, you know, is to get the tumor out with as minimum damage to the patient's nerve and to the brain as possible. And although every attempt is made to preserve the cochlear nerve, now, in an NF2, in a, in a vestibular schwannoma, which is bilateral in an NF2, becomes even more difficult because in NF2, the additions or adherence to the cochlear nucleus is even more than in a, a straightforward unilateral similar form. So it, it basically the tumor is very adherent to the cochlear nucleus. So preservation of the cochlear nerve becomes extremely difficult in a bilateral form. The reason why you cannot stimulate the um, the cochlear because the cochlear is the cochlea is innovated, so stimulating it does not make any sense. So you have to go higher up, and uh, the brainstorm implant is the obvious solution. The next indication, which is the bilateral ossified cochlea, where the cochlea is completely ossified. Now, in general, the ossification happens in two situations. One, the classical situation is in a post meningitic cochlea, where the ossification can start very early, even uh, sometimes even two to three weeks uh, or two weeks after the uh, episode of meningitis, you start looking at the scans, you may start seeing evidence of ossification. Scans. In, a, in a matter of one to one hour months, the entire cochlear can be completely ossified. So it's very important for that reason in a post meningitic deafness to kill it. Because I, I see some uh, situations as children where the, the doctors, particularly uh, many of the uh, you know, uh, pediatricians who are not aware of this uh, situation, tell them, you know, counsel them to eat. Understandably, because child is recovered from a very major episode. So the, the tendency is saying, no, don't go for surgery immediately, let the child recover a bit, let's wait three months, let's wait four months. But in these three to four months, uh, the ossification of the cochlea may be so dense that you may not be able to intervene and do a cochlea. So, which is why the correct advice to give in a ossified cochlea, post meningitic cochlea, is to intervene at the So, this is one situation where I would say a cochlea is not So, you can't wait. The other situation where the cochlea may get ossified is bilateral cochlear autosomes. Here, sometimes the autosporotic, autospongiotic focus can completely fill the cochlea. It's extremely difficult to actually get an implant into this cochlea. You, you may do drill outs, you may do various things, but it, sometimes it may be very, very difficult. So these are the uh, situations where a cochlear ossification, if it's very dense, a cochlear implant may not be possible and then it may have Incidentally, bilateral uh, autospongiotic cochlea, which is very, very dense and where you cannot get a cochlear implant and you have to do a brainstem implant, one of the conditions where the brainstem implant gives very good outcomes. 
it's a good indicator because it's an environment situation. And also there's no tumor which will distort the brain uh, stem. All these situations, a cochlear autosclerosis is a, a very good indicator uh, for what it is raised in blood. If the cochlear is not, it's not possible. The next indication is bilateral temporal bone fracture with cochlear nerve. Well, this is a very, very, very rare situation. In fact, in all these years, I have seen only two patients, two patients who had bilateral temporal bone fracture with cochlear nerve. Um, unfortunately, both of them did not opt, uh, go for a basal implant simply because you know it is expensive and But I have only seen two patients, and I think most surgeons may not have seen one at all. It's a very, very rare condition. The other condition which I put a question mark is bilateral audit neuropathy. Now, audit neuropathy may be peripheral or central. In a peripheral audit neuropathy, a cochlear implant does brilliantly well. The other situation is where it is central, and this differentiation between whether it's peripheral or central is usually made out by an EAPR, an electrically evoked auditory base support, where you keep an electrode. In the near the round window, it's known as a J electrode with a shape like that, a J kept near the round window and you stimulate and you try to elicit a brainstem response. If you do get a response, it means that this is a peripheral type and uh, these people do very well with the cochlear. But if you do not get a response in any area, then that's a transmitted as a central type. In a central type, people have uh, tried. Uh, uh, but it's not been very uh, good in its outcome. So that's why I put a big question mark. I'm not very sure whether this one should actually work as an uh, indication. Now, the bigger indication is emerging today, uh, and it is where I am going to be talking more about, is a pediatric auditory brain center. Now, this is in children who, who are born with complete apps. Of the cochlea, the cochlea. The CI is not possible naturally because if there's no cochlea, where are you going to put a cochlear implant? Similarly, if a cochlear nerve is not present, there's no point in doing a cochlear implant. So, if there is a complete absence of the cochlea or the cochlear nerve, then uh, uh, the cochlear implant is not possible. And these are children for whom there's no other option but a brain. Now, I must tell you a little bit about the, uh, the history of this. Now, the, the person who first did this, uh, was, uh, the person who first did a brain implant was none other than Bill House. Uh, and he did it in an elderly lady who had, a young lady, not elderly, a young lady who had bilateral vestibular schwannoma. He and Hitzelberger put an electrode uh, in the uh, single channel in the uh, brain stem. He had uh, uh, response to it. In fact, interestingly, uh, brains and implants uh, stimulation was done even before a cochlear implantation came into the picture. So, in a, in a sense, historically, ABI precedes a cochlear implant. So this is an interesting uh, uh, fact. Uh, but uh, very soon, that didn't work very well. Uh, but that lady had the brains and implant for a very, very long time. But she used it for a long time. She used it along with the brain. Now, uh, uh, today, the pediatric medicine implant had its origin mainly in Italy. And it was done by a surgeon uh, by the name Vittorio Colletti. Uh, Vittorio Colletti was in Verona. In fact, he's been here. Uh, he has been to Chennai as well. Uh, we met him for. Of the conference here, cochlear implant conference, uh, and uh, he uh, actually did this quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, nearly uh, years ago. And uh, he was quietly doing it, and he had a series of about fourteen or fifteen children, in whom he he had produced fairly surprising results. Now, when he published it, there's a lot of skepticism around the world, particularly in the U.S. The surgeons were refusing to believe that uh, he do this in a congenitally deaf child and give the child some uh, experience and hearing and then with the language. So what happened was 
uh, there was a whole team which was deputed by the American Academy to go and visit Vittorio's center and uh, see these children for themselves and see evaluate them. And this one very uh, uh, eminent uh, audiologist, Bob Shannon, who was uh, uh, then asked to go and see along with this. He formed went there and along with them got a whole lot of uh, nearly about 20 surgeons from the US bent visited the center in Verona, and they were quite shocked to see the excellent results that come out of the center. So they were then, uh, you know, pretty uh, uh, surprised by the whole uh, thing. And they reported back saying that, yeah, we have something which is uh, working. So that's how the pediatric uh, indication came into the picture. I can see Bala there. Uh, 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 Welcome to Pala. So, therefore, pediatric auditory basal implantation came into the uh, indication. Here are some pictures of uh, a bilateral NF2. You can see a, a bilateral NF2. You can see a complete cochlear nerve place. You can see an intraoptic image, which is totally. And an MRI, in which there is a complete absence. And here again, you know, you see a very rudimentary cochlea, this is a, a cystic cochlea, and, and uh, you cannot put a cochlea in that. Almost all but, and there's no cochlea in uh, And Or you may have a situation like this, where you, know, you can see that the ossification has become very dense in the cochlea. On the other side, you see practically almost, you just see what is known as a ghost. So you just see the ghost shadow of the cochlea and you don't see the lumen at all. So if you do an MRI, there is completely, you can see the cochlear nerve, but no fluid signal in the cochlea or vestibule. So this is a total ossification. So you cannot get a cochlear no matter what you do. That is very, very difficult to see. So this is another indication which I found. So to summarize, the most important indications are bilateral mishare deformity, where there's no inner ear development at all, both sides, and aplasia of the cochlear nerve. You see both sides, no cochlear nerve, and a severely ossified cochlea and cochlear So a few years ago, what happened was all the important centers doing brainstorm implantation, there are hardly about uh, 12 or 13 centers which are doing in, in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> all met together in uh, in uh, Cyprus and uh, we all sat and did a brainstorming session and came out with a consensus statement. It's known as a European consensus statement, actually it's not European, it's international consensus statement. And uh, so what is the summary of this statement? So what are the well-defined indications? So one is, as I said, complete labyrinthian aplasia, which is Michel aplasia, cochlear aplasia, cochlear nerve aplasia, or if the cochlear aperture itself is closed. This is where the, the uh, cochlear aperture, if you recall, is the base of the modulus, where the cochlear nerve exits the modulus and uh, goes into the cellular corona, the brainstem. So sometimes this aperture is fully closed. If it is fully closed, that means the cochlear, cochlear nerve is not going into the uh, CPI. Now the other indications, which are probably a little relative, you know, we have to think about them a little bit. One is the hypoplastic cochlear, cochlear aperture hypoplastic. Here there's a hypoplastic cochlear. Cochlear is present, but hypoplastic. And the nerve also is present, but it is hypoplastic. So this is one situation. Now in a situation like this, today we would be First, compelled to do a cochlear implantation, maybe with a compressor. And if it doesn't work, then revert to a brain cell. Second thing is a common cavity or incomplete partition type 1. Now, if you remember Sendrovo's classification, incomplete partition type 1 is where there's absolutely no, uh, uh, it, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's no scale at all. In this situation, even if you do a cochlear implant, the outcomes are so poor. And a brainstem implant outcome seems to be better than a cochlear implant. So this is because the, the 
nerve uh, neural endings inside this incomplete partition cavity. A common cavity is in the periphery of the cavity. It's not there's no modulus at all. So because there's no modulus, it's spread out over the walls, and therefore your stimulation also becomes very immediate. So in a situation like that, a brain stem implants in Second, of course, is where first is where in, in addition to this, cochlear nerve is not present. Secondly, even if the cochlear nerve is present, the, the distribution of the neural tissue is very unpredictable. Therefore, ABI does better than the Third is an unbranched cochlear vestibular nerve, where the cochlear and the vestibular nerve are both one and the same area. Now, this is really a challenge because we don't know whether there's enough cochlear nerve fibers in this single bundle to transmit enough information. So, in, what do we do in a situation like this? Well, we, we do an EABR, and if you have some response, then we do a cochlear implant. But then, in many of these children, cochlear implant may not function because there's just not enough uh, fibers to transmit information. So, then uh, we then can't. The reverse back to an ABI. So we do a cochlear implant first, see it gives about give about six months time. If it doesn't really produce any results, then uh, revise it for an ABI. And then the, the, the very common situation of a thin cochlear nerve. The nerve is present in hyperplastic. Now, when do you call a, a cochlear nerve hyperplastic? Simply speaking, a cochlear nerve in diameter is at least as big as a patient nerve. So if you look at the Cross sectional anatomy in the diagram, uh, uh, easily do with an MRI, you will see four nerves. And the cochlear nerve is the thickest on the lung. If the cochlear nerve is at least as, uh, has to have a diameter of the facial nerve, only then you can consider it as normal. If it is smaller than the cochlear facial nerve, then you call that as a hypoplastic nerve. And if the hypoplastic cochlear nerve has less than 50% of the usual diameter, then it becomes a very significant hyperplastic nerve. Now we don't know whether this nerve is going to function or not. Again, we go back to EABR, stimulating the cochlea with the electrode and seeing whether there is a response in the brainstem. That will tell you, yes, this nerve is functioning. And then you do a cochlear implant. If still the cochlear implant is not working or not producing enough results, then we have to think about revising for an ABI. So these are all relative indications. What about the acquired indications? I told you some of them already. One is the severe ossification of the cochlea, or what is known as a white out of the cochlea. And second is a bilateral temporal bone fracture with our And as I said, severe cochlear autosclerosis, again with extensive ossification of the cochlea, where a cochlear nerve is, implant is not possible. And occasionally, even if you have a cochlear uh, autosclerosis, you still say when you manage to put a cochlea implant inside, Sometimes there may be severe facial nerve stimulation. Why does this happen? Because autospongiotic bone is extremely porous and conductive to electricity. Electricity leaks through this bone. So if you put a cochlear implant and you stimulate, the electricity may leak in all directions. Particularly, the second turn of the cochlea is in extremely close proximity to the geniculate ganglion of the patient. You remember the anatomy. You remember the process of cochlearyformis in the middle layer. The process of cochlearyformis is an important landmark because immediately above the process of cochlearyformis, if you recall, is where the geniculate ganglion is located. And immediately below the process of cochlearyformis is where the second turn of the cochlea is. The bone which separates the second turn of the cochlea from the geniculate ganglion may be something very thin or even nice. And it may be less than even two millimeters in. in this situation add to the fact that an autospongiotic bone is very very porous for the electricity conductivity so you may get a lot of facial nerve stimulation every time you stimulate the cochlea the cochlea of course it's possible if only few electrodes are stimulating you just shut off those electrodes and then and take the rest of the electrodes in the cochlea but if the entire cochlea is leaking and whichever electrode you stimulate, you produce facial nerve stimulation, then the cochlear implant becomes useless. In that situation, again, a brainstem implant is what you need. So, to summarize, the present indications are Michel deformity, where there's complete absence of the 
complete absence of the cochlea and the aperture closure, the cochlear aperture take place here. And relative indications are an incomplete partition type one or a common cavity or the cochlear nerve and a, a, an unbranched cochlear vestibular nerve or a hypoplastic cochlear nerve and uh, where you know your cochlear implant is right first and then only unbranched. And the acquired indications are white out of the cochlea or extensive cochlear autophoresis and bilateral temporal bone fracture in cochlear nerve. So these are the indicators. How do we, what, are the, what is the preoperative work? It's almost the same as in a cochlear implant. The only difference being that you also want to have an MRI of the brain. And you want to have an MRI of the brain, the brain stem, and you want to know the anatomy of the brain stem particularly with regards to the cochlear nucleus. Now, where is the cochlear nucleus in the brainstem? The, the best uh, uh, guide for that is the inferior cerebellar reductor. So the cochlear nucleus literally straddles the inferior cerebellar like a person sitting on a horse. So once I on the dorsal to the inferior cerebellar reductor, the ventral to the uh, inferior cerebellar reductor, is the ventral cochlea. So if you can image that part, then you can get a good idea of the cochlea. You also want to know the the relative uh, anatomy in that region, particularly with regards to the flockings. I will come to that in a short. So basically, you want to do a full audiological workup. You want to do a, a, a imaging, particularly the MRI. And an EABR is usually whenever there is a cochlea nerve wherever the cochlear nerve is thin or even uh, not visualized, you will then do it. Uh, one word about this thin cochlear nerve when it's not visualized. To identify that the cochlear nerve is thin or absent, the minimum you require is a 3 Tesla MRI. With an 1.5 Tesla MRI, you cannot make out the details of the cochlear nerve. So if somebody does a 1.5 Tesla MRI of the brain, and the report comes as thin cochlear nerve, don't go by it. Please ask for a 3 Tesla MRI, and only with a 3 Tesla MRI will you be able to say that this definitely is a, a thin cochlear okay, So, this is a very important point. So, what are the surgical approaches? Generally, in an, in an acoustic bilateral vestibular trauma, we may go either plant slab or retrospective. But in a pediatric API, invariably, most of us prefer a retrospective. We don't want to disturb the uh, go behind it and then approach the API. So, these are the, uh, for a pediatric API, we prefer retrospective. For a pediatric we may go either trans lab uh, or retrospective. Now, what are the anatomical landmarks? It's very important. Now, there are basically a few points that you have to be. The important landmark is the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus marks the entrance to the larynx. And lateral plexus is the entry point to reach the cochlear nucleus. So the choroid plexus marks the entrance, and the roof of the lateral plexus is covered by the tinea. So this is the first point of the implant. The uh, entrance is covered by a very important structure, which is the cochlear. Basically, choroid plexus is the hero of the show because that's what that's what guides you into the, uh, the lateral plexus. And the villain is the plotulus because the plotulus is what covers the or hides the 